The following edition of Connecticut Valley Views is made possible by Windsor Federal Savings, with offices in Windsor, Bloomfield, Granby, and East Windsor. Neighbors helping neighbors since 1936. Join me, Susan Regan, host of Connecticut Valley Views, the most widely watched interview program on Connecticut Public Access TV. Proof to the people is the byline, insight without bias, generating a 360 perspective. Our mission is to focus on topical subjects with thought-provoking interviews regarding municipal leadership, current affairs, educational and political topics, as well as key destination points in New England. Thank you for joining me today. We are at the Legislative Office building in Hartford, and my guest is Republican Senator John Kissel from the 7th District and Chief Deputy Minority Leader. He might add that he's the host of his own public access TV show, Senator Kissel and Friends, and it's such a pleasure to be here with you. Susan, today, my pleasure. Okay. Uh, Senator Kissel, congratulations on your recent Thank election. You. Uh, I wanted to ask you, since you've been here and in this position since 1993. Correct. Over the years, did you see anything different about this? Did when you were talking to your constituents, when you were out there in the field, you were knocking on doors and, and raising the boats and so forth, anything different, major issues that you've seen in other years? Well, absolutely. I mean, when I first was elected in a special election uh, in February of 1993, uh, we didn't even have com laptop computers in this building. Uh, the world has changed so much in the last 22 years since I've been lucky enough to serve the people of the 7th District. And their issues have changed. I mean, back when I was first elected, you know, the state had just passed the income tax and people were still of the opinion that it could be repealed. Well, we've come to the realization that that's just not going to happen. And actually, in the last four years, we've had the largest tax increase in Connecticut history under Democratic Governor Daniel Malloy. Technology drives many of the issues that come before Certainly. this legislature. And what happens in other states also tends to affect us one way or another. Uh, so all of those things combined, I've seen the world has changed in 22 years. Mm -hmm. This building has changed in 22 years. But unfortunately, what I see right now when I've gone and knocked on doors and talked to my constituents and campaigned for re-election, people are extremely struggling financially right now. Mm -hmm. Fixed costs have just gone up and their incomes have barely kept up the pace. Uh, many people's uh, salaries have been frozen or their hours have been cut back or full-time jobs have been made part-time jobs. Uh, benefits packages have been rolled back. And so people are hurting out there. And to the extent that the government keeps coming around saying, oh, you can afford a tax right. increase here or something over there, people are saying, we really can't. They're We're, starting to make choices. Do I buy the medicine? Do I send the kid to college? Do I cut back on my retirement? Absolutely. And it's very, it's very real. And unlike back in the early 1990s when we did suffer a, a, a fairly significant recession, that was rather short-lived. Uh, and then again, after 2001, when we had the uh, World Trade Towers and 9-11, you know, we suffered an economic malaise for about a year and a half, two years there. But we snapped out of it. But since 2008, it's been a steady struggle, and Connecticut has lagged other states in trying to rebound We're after. We're always that point above the unemployment. We're yeah, always the and, one so, that's and so, and so, so that's really that's on people's minds right now. And uh, the governor-elect, uh, Governor Malloy, uh, in now going to be sworn in for a second term, promised no new taxes, but. You know, uh, I'm sure we're going to get to the point where we have to talk about the budget, and we're, we're looking at looming uh, budget deficits. Well, I think there's another point to be made, too. Even if people feel as though they might move to another state, their land values, their home values have gone down. So whatever they've invested in their home, which is often for people traditionally and historically, is their major investment for their life. And sometimes they look at that as their retirement nest egg. Absolutely. But now they're going to leave the state, leave their friends, perhaps leave families, uh, leave, and their children are leaving friends and, 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 a, and a home. But they're not even going to get as much for their home as they thought they might. So they're trapped. It, it's an interesting conundrum that we're facing. And I actually had an opportunity in the last uh, year or so to go to a lecture presented by a, a person who was an expert in demo, uh, uh, demographics. Mm -hmm. And you're exactly correct. People reach a certain age in their life where they go, okay, I'm going to liquidate my nest egg, my home, 
take what I can out of it, take the equity out of there, and maybe move to another state. Well, people's value in their homes either has been gobbled up because the house values have come down, or they've had to get home equity loans just to make ends meet. So they don't have that wherewithal. So those folks aren't leaving. And what's that, what that's causing is a stagnation in people that are in younger age demographics to move up corporate ladders, to get better paying mm -hmm. jobs. So we're in this sort of economic malaise that's driven by house values, that's driven by changes in, in corporate communities, uh, changes in the way the world and the nation does business. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to sort of, you know, match competitiveness with other states, and so businesses are acting accordingly, but that's putting people in positions where, again, hours are being cut back, benefit packages are being cut back. Nonetheless, what I told my constituents and what they want me to champion is, hey, other states are able to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Other states are leading the way and moving in a positive direction. It's it's not. So what then, is it the leadership? Is it? I mean, I mean, other states are doing it, but what 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 could we do to change it? I think that we need to stop just going back to the people and raising taxes. Mm -hmm. I think that we need to make government more efficient. I'm not for the wholesale uh, laying off of, of state workers by any means, mm -hmm. but we should be able to draw efficiency so that it, through attrition we draw those efficiencies out. We don't seem to be able to do that in our state. We also have extraordinarily gener generous benefit packages mm -hmm. for our retired state employees. Mm -hmm. And while I wouldn't advocate taking away anything that's been promised to someone, mm -hmm. if you've worked 20, 25, 30, they're 35 years, that. they're relying on that. But for new hires, I think it needs to be much more in Stranger. comportment, mm -hmm. much more in comportment with the private sector. And I think that, you know, folks out there that are struggling to get a job, I think that they would accept those terms if they could at least get a job. Well, at least if you know ahead what you it can is plan. You, you, you can, can plan. plan. But those who've already committed and, and put the exactly. time. Exactly. And what I've, I've gone and actually I have a lot of major insurance companies mm -hmm. that I represent in my district. Uh, I'll name one. Mass Mutual has a major corporate office presence in Enfield. And in speaking to the leadership of that company, and I'm not advocating for folks to go there, sure. but they said, if we get young people right now, we can put them on a course where they're going to have a great retirement when they retire in 40 years. Mm -hmm. But for the folks that are like in their late 40s, 50s, and 60s that haven't planned accordingly, it's very difficult to make that switch in this economy right now. So, oh, yeah, so we're facing a lot of things. But what I would suggest to you, Susan, mm. is this. It used to be the South and the, and the Southwest were we were competing against. Mm -hmm. In other words, the North Carolinas, sure. the Floridas, the Arizonas. Well, now we should be able to compete with the New Yorks and the Massachusetts and Certainly Northeast in, states. In our, and we're falling behind there as well. So we should be able to learn from our next door neighbors. And if we can't do that, then we're in a heap of trouble. Well, I think also when you talk about the age groups and the young people, the young people are looking for the jobs and the older people because of their economic situation, are staying in their jobs longer, right. holding on to them, and because of their service and their tenure and so forth. Exactly. Are, and, the, and the unions, perhaps they're, able, they're allowed to do that. Whether it's corporate individuals or whether it's teachers, all across the board. I mean, it, you know, people are insecure about their futures. And so the last thing you want to do is pick up, sell your major asset, and quit your job and hope that, you know, the grass is mm. greener somewhere far away. Mm. So you're exactly correct, Susan. Mm -hmm. All right, um, November 23rd, Hartford Current article by Kevin Rennie, and this brings us to talk about the budget. Uh, Malloy overlooked the permanent fiscal crisis. That's a quote. He states that in less than five months into the state's fiscal year, its budget is $100 million in deficit. And since then, Governor Malloy has instituted major reductions across the board. We've seen that in the paper. He's going to re sure. reduce administrative offices. Do you, you think that's the solution? Is that he's going to have a hiring freeze? I mean, what other areas could we look at? Well, first of all, and, and again, predicated on what we had just talked about, mm -hmm. I don't want our viewers to think that it's all doom and gloom. I wouldn't mm -hmm. keep running for office and, and fighting the good fight unless I thought that we could make positive changes going forward. And there was a time not that long ago where Connecticut was a destination state for businesses and individuals to really grow and prosper. I think we should be more nimble and we can get back to that. Mm -hmm. I applaud the governor for most of his unilateral cuts that he made mm -hmm. to close the gap Although I share uh, my new leader, Senator Len Fasano's concerns about DCF because there's a lot of problems with dysfunctional families and children and I'm not so sure the Department of Children and Families is the area where you want to make these cuts. That being said, mm -hmm. the cuts have to come someplace, but the governor has only done half the job. 
And so I know that leaders of both my caucus and the House Republicans wanted to have a special session. That's been rebuffed. Like but oh, December 15th, I think you wanted. Right. And, I, and, and the leadership on the Democratic side has said they're not going to do that. Well, we're all going to be sworn into a, a new term in a few weeks. Mm -hmm. And then it's all going to be there staring us in the face. I'm less concerned about trying to patch up this year's uh, fiscal deficit of about 40 to 50 after the governor's mm -hmm. cuts between now and Ju July 1st mm -hmm. of 2015. Mm -hmm. But it's around that bend. Mm. The two next fiscal years that it is our charge to address this coming session were the first fiscal year, July 1, 2015 to the end of June 2016. Mm -hmm. The deficit is projected to be anywhere from 1.4 to 1.6 billion dollars. And isn't that due also because there's a, a, a short sheet on the revenue too? I mean, they're, they're supposedly they talk about the revenues, but those aren't going to be there. There's two huge drivers. We have very generous benefits in our social service programs that drives a lot of folks in need to our state. And while that's very laudable, we can't put ourselves at a competitive disadvantage with all the other states. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what the comptroller, Kevin Limbo, has pointed out in the last several months is that there's been higher demand for social service programs beyond what was budgeted for. At the same time, Susan, you're exactly correct that revenues have decreased, particularly in areas such as sales taxes and things like that, because mm -hmm. as we had said, mm -hmm. people are struggling, they're mm -hmm. making choices, and what they're doing is saying, I have my utility bills, I have my mortgage, I have to make sure the kids have food, I have to make sure I have gas to go to work. Right. And once you do all those sort of fixed costs, there's not a lot of leeway left. And so people are putting off major purchases. People are, uh, you know, scrimping to mm -hmm. make things stretch out. It might be great to get in, in your house all the greatest flat screen TVs mm -hmm. and computer products. Mm -hmm. But our family, and I know so many other families, it's, well, if it's not broke, I'm not going to run out and replace it because I've got to pay this month's bills and I don't want to keep putting things on credit cards. Well, the, and so yeah. that drives down the revenues that we're getting as far as taxes. Right, and I think the other thing that's impacting, which is big on people's minds, is the health care thing. I mean, sure. I mean, this whole thing about the health care. Now, we're fairly, fairly good position in Connecticut, although I think there have been some issues that have come up now, whether the people who supposedly signed up last year are still actually covered. Then there's confusion about when you go to the doctor, you feel you've paid your premium. But when you get to the doctor, they say, I don't see you on here. Right. Then you can't get to the doctor you really wanted to go to. And, and, and so the whole thing has become a cloud, and people are going to say, am I going to end up paying out? You know what? I think I'm just going to pay the fine, and I'm going to pay out of pocket. But then what if something really disastrous happens? So they've got all of these looming what ifs that, are, that is a consternation to, to everybody, and they're trying to plan and not sure exactly which horse to ride. Exactly, and, then, and that goes for smaller, mid-sized businesses as well. So if you're, let, let's say you're doing well, you're in an area of the economy that seems to be prospering, and a lot of restaurants seem to be doing better right now. Uh, if you're selling high-tech gadgets, maybe you're doing better right now. But it's like, hmm, do I add employees or don't I? Mm -hmm. And Susan, this issue regarding health care and Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act, however you want to say mm -hmm. it, and you're right, Connecticut, as opposed to other nations, has, has done better, mm -hmm. but there are still a lot of glitches. But there's also huge question marks as to what are the liabilities going to be going forward. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm a business person and I'm thinking about maybe hiring some folks, I'm going to say, you know what, it's better to hire two part-timers than to take a chance <coughs> on a full-time employee and maybe I'll be on the hook for way more than I've budgeted and for. And stay under that 50 number exactly. and, and so forth. Exactly. Well, what about, let me, let me just uh, digress a little bit. I won't say digress, but let me say that the immigrant situation that we have, do you think that we see some of this impact in Connecticut? Do we see the influx coming over the Mexican border? Do you see people coming here who will also need to be uh, helped and aided and so forth? Well, we're about, <coughs> we've just this week embarked on an experiment. We'll see where it leads us. But, you know, Connecticut made a decision. I opposed it to mm -hmm. grant driver's licenses to undocumented aliens or mm -hmm. illegal immigrants. Mm -hmm. uh, in the la and I think I read uh, recently that in the first 12 to 18 hours, over 6,000 people have gotten these licenses. Let's see how this all rolls out. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe it'll be a good thing. It's being championed that, well, proper identification, we'll make sure that these folks have insurance, if they're in their automobiles and all this stuff, laudable goals. 
but also do we want to make life easier for folks that haven't followed the rules to gain access to the United States? And it depends on where you live. Uh, the federal government, I don't think, has disproportionately put people from mm -hmm. other countries in Connecticut, but we have historically had large Ecuadorian population in the Danbury area, mm -hmm. and folks from South America and Bridgeport <coughs> and Waterbury <coughs> and Hartford and New Haven. And so how this all plays out, especially with President Obama's unilateral decision to mm -hmm. change the rules regarding undocumented aliens or illegal immigrants, uh, again, I see it inevitably putting more fiscal pressure on all the states at a time when they're struggling to build their economies. Yeah. Well, talking about driving, let's talk about border tolls. Sure. What your your position on that? Well, I dr I strongly oppose border tolls mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons. First of all, representing North Central Connecticut, uh, our highway system was not designed to have tolls on it. The one that people are probably most familiar with is Interstate 91, which mm -hmm. goes right from Springfield down into Hartford, north to south, and Route 5 parallels that. So if you put mm -hmm. tolls on 91, I see a ton of people avoiding those tolls, shifting to Route 5, mm -hmm. and making huge parking problems and driving problems and bottlenecks all along that corridor. So I just don't think that's appropriate. But what a lot of folks aren't aware of is the federal government will penalize states hugely, tens of millions of dollars, if you put a toll on a pre-existing federal highway. And so if you put a toll on 95 or mm -hmm. 91 or any of the other interstate highways that are already built in Connecticut, we will lose tens of millions of dollars of federal funds. And so you have to make that up just to get to zero before you even start collecting revenue. So the whole revenues. thing will be neutralized, whatever exactly. you're Exactly. So they're trying to sneak it in a little bit, the advocates, <coughs> by putting it on roads that haven't been finished. Mm -hmm. uh, but I really do think that for practical reasons, environmental reasons, safety reasons, and economic reasons, it's a bad idea for Connecticut. Mm -hmm. You know what? It's not a question of we don't have enough revenues in the state. We just spend profligately, and we haven't really reined in our our state spending for a smaller state in the Northeast that should be more nimble about mm -hmm. these things. Mm -hmm. So I did talk to some people and they go, well, I drive through New Jersey, I drive mm -hmm. through this state, and it's not a problem. You know, even if you go on the Mass Pike on a weekend and people are using the Easy Pass, there's still huge traffic jams. And so imagine that each and every day in Connecticut where we depend on these interstate highways. And let's not forget, you know, back down in Fairfield County, we had that guy, Mr. Klutz, who fell asleep at the wheel right. and killed several people at mm -hmm. a toll plaza. That can happen all over again. They're not really safe to have on the highways. And I haven't been convinced about the whole easy mm -hmm. pass notion. Mm -hmm. And we have a hard time making sure everybody carries appropriate insurance, let alone that we're going to be going after people that don't put these... Uh, things in their car for the easy path. Sure. Well, the governor said no new taxes. And, and if we don't do the toll thing, I mean, d do you believe the statement no new taxes? Or does it mean we're going to raise taxes on existing things where we're already <laughs> taxed? I mean, well, somewhere you we, know, when the, the governor, money has to come. Sure. When the governor made that promise, I mean, I was hopeful, but I didn't know where he had stashed his magic wand. <laughs> I see. You know, uh, if passed his prologue, he has yeah. a history of raising taxes. Mm. He has a history of not necessarily coming through on his promises or wording the promises mm. in a way so there's wiggle room mm -hmm. the old president bill clinton depends on what the word mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. and you know the public's sort of tired of saying you know quit trying to pull these shenanigans yeah. on us you know say what you got to do and do it mm -hmm. uh i think the, the governor inevitably will be faced with some kind of need to increase revenue somehow but I think tolls will actually work an economic burden ultimately. I think that uh, raising taxes on the middle class is not a great idea. I know that a lot of folks in the Republican Party say don't raise mm. taxes on the wealthy, mm. uh, but that's always an easy place sure. to go. But Fairfield County is 40% of our revenue. <clears throat> if you chase away the, the job makers, then you may undermine everything. So he's going to have some difficult decisions to make, but at least a few weeks after the election, he's still saying he's going to stick to that no tax increase pledge. Well, let's hope How he does. How he gets there yeah. is, you know, God bless him. Let's, let's hope he does. All right. Uh, if, if one good note is our, our gas price is going down. Yes. Let's, let's leave the highway and move to the air. Okay. Drones. Sure. Your comments on drones. Well, uh, I, currently I serve as co-chairman of the Program Review and Investigations mm -hmm. Committee and the Judiciary Committee, which I also serve on, charge program review to study drones. Uh, currently, the FAA has got 
cognizance, Federal Aeronautic Administration has cognizance over drones, and they have a moratorium, but it's a mm -hmm. technology that's out there that's extremely beneficial. Mm -hmm. Let's say you have a massive uh, nor'easter or ice storm, mm -hmm. and you want to assess damage to utility lines and highways mm -hmm. and people's homes. All you have to do is get those drones up in the air and they can immediately send down that information. And we had a demonstration at the Capitol mm -hmm. just a couple of months ago and it was phenomenal the, how much technology is in this little contraption that can go up thousands of feet in a matter of seconds and give you really highly detailed video as mm -hmm. to what it's spotting. Mm -hmm. That being said, we also want to make sure that we balance, we balance that with privacy mm -hmm. interests and while law enforcement wants to really be able to use it for whatever they can, mm. we don't want to have a situation where a drone is popping up to someone's bedroom window and spying the in there. Nose and under the tent and pretty exactly, soon exactly. So we're going to try to balance it all mm. while at the same time un understanding that the federal government may turn around and say, you don't have the authority to do that. At the same time, other states like North Carolina have like had a ban on drones. I think there's just too much good there let's say you have an infrared or heat-seeking camera on a drone and you're out over some state park or forest mm -hmm. looking for a lost child. It could, it could save yes, people, well, there, yeah, save people's course. lives. We, we've had it used just in the last year by firefighters to go behind a building where they couldn't tell if the building was close to explosives mm -hmm. and the drone was able to go into very dangerous areas to assess mm -hmm. could they put the fire out before it got too dangerous or couldn't they? And so for a lot of things, uh, let's say a wanted criminal, I have no problem with law enforcement using it to try to mm -hmm. seek out a wanted criminal. But again, there's a fine line between using it for laudable purposes and then having it get too much in our own privacy uh, of our own personal lives. And so we want to draw those lines. I think the other thing people are concerned about, too, is that we have a number of small uh, if they're not private, they're small uh, airways areas in Connecticut along with Bradley Airfield. Sure. So I think people are concerned too, you know, will, will, could this interfere with the airplanes? Could, could there be an accident? I mean, well, that's a concern. Susan, you're exactly correct. And when we had the demonstration at the Capitol, the person who was the expert with the drone actually made sure that he radioed to Brainerd and told him what they were doing so that he got permission to go as high as he went. But Brainerd, which is right here in the Greater Hartford mm -hmm. area, was notified. And so, yes, we can't have people out there using this willy-nilly either because it could, let's say it got driven by a novice into a utility line, a transmission line, uh, or fell out of the sky you and landed sure landed people, on someone's head. Yeah, I mean, you have to make sure they're certified. Sure, to, sure. To do the thing. So I think the safety measure, the privacy measure, and if used uh, inappropriate, times and areas and under supervised conditions then people would accept it. I think so. I yeah. think it's got a lot. I mean if you're a farmer you can go and mm -hmm. check out the lay of your land, your cattle, your cows, your tobacco, sure. netting, whatever. Well, given what happened during the midterms on a national basis, obviously there was a great red wave across the United States. Uh, it didn't happen in Connecticut. No, that wave <laughs> sort of stops at our shores. It stopped there, but y you did make inroads. You've got, sure. I believe it's 10 new House seats. 10 new House seats, one picked up one Senate seat, uh, and it was a, you know, a, a close election for governor, you know, less than 25,000 votes. Uh, the Democrats, you know, are, you know, crowing about the fact that Governor Malloy was able to increase his lead a little bit uh, over uh, Mr. Foley, but mm. got to be honest, this should have been a cakewalk for Governor Malloy, mm -hmm. and it wasn't. He had mm. to fight tooth and nail just to stay where he was. In the Northeast, uh, that should never have been the case. Because mm -hmm. so. you, you lost uh, by less than 2,000 votes, I think, a majority in the House. So, so it, it, a lot of super tight races, yeah. and we had some very, very tight races mm -hmm. for the state Senate as well. Mm -hmm. so, so we're competitive. Uh, hopefully, we'll be more competitive in, in the years to come. Is it, is it a learning process of how to win more things? I mean, well, or, or is it getting the right people? Is it getting the right people to run? A lot of it's getting the right people. A lot of it's getting people's attention focused in the right areas. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I don't want to say anything disparaging about uh, mm -hmm. Ambassador Foley, but, mm -hmm. you know, uh, some folks have felt that maybe some other people at the top of the ticket might have been more <coughs> inspirational. I don't know. It's always easy to 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 to, to be a uh, you know quarterback mm. after the game's all over. Mm. That being said, I believe that we we learn every cycle. Mm -hmm. We're moving in a positive direction as far as the legislature mm -hmm. goes. I think the state Republican Party will field 
really credible candidates. We had Tim Herbst was a great credible candidate yes. uh, when he was running for state treasurer. But you know, we have built-in disadvantages. Mm -hmm. We have a, an awful lot of Democrats, but. The, the saving grace is that there's a ton of unaffiliated voters and we need to win over a vast majority of the unaffiliated voters with popular candidates with good messages. I think we can get there and I've actually been lucky enough to serve in the majority in the Senate once upon a time uh, back in yeah. the mid 90s and we were able to lead the country with welfare mm -hmm. reform and, and, and a lot of other great things uh, and I think that we can get back there again. Yeah. Well, uh, speaking of control, uh, we have a new House Minority Leader, uh, Themis Chloridis? Claritis. 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 Sorry, Themis. <laughs> uh, from Derby. She's been the 114th House District Representative since 1998 and served as Deputy Leader since 2007. And the big story here is that she's the first woman to lead the GOP in the House. And I think that's to be congratulated. I, sure. I, I, I think not only for her, but I think that says something about the party as well because it was, she, she was a very popular pick, apparently. I mean, she. I mean, they were really rooting for it to get it. Well, yeah. well give us credit. We had <laughs> Emma Dela Eads in the Senate as the Republican leading yes. uh, as Senate president when, again, those two years when I was yes. in the majority. Uh, Themis is a fabulous person. I've enjoyed working with her on the Judiciary Committee. She's going to be a great leader. Uh, she's very practical, down to earth, very interested in, in family law issues. Uh, and the fact that she does have widespread appeal and support mm -hmm. amongst her colleagues mm -hmm. is fabulous. That being said, I've also noticed that our new leader, Senator Fasano and Themis, have joined already in calling for certain things from the Democratic majority or Governor Malloy, so they're going to work really well together as a mm -hmm. team. That's fabulous as well. So I think all of these things really uh, are auspicious for my party, the Republican Party here in Connecticut. Uh, it's just not an easy state for our party sure. uh, over the last couple of decades, but then again, give ourselves some credit. You know, we had Governor Rowland for a number of mm -hmm. years. We had Governor Rell for a number of years. Uh, we were in the Senate in a majority for a couple of years, and then we had then we were only marginally outside sure. of the majority. So things go in cycles, yeah. and I think the cycle is moving in our direction, and we've got some great brand new leaders in the House and the Senate on our Well, speaking side. of new leaders, I want to ask you a question. Sure. All right. What about you? You've been in the corporate world for many years uh, as a corporate attorney for Northeast Utilities. Uh, you've been an advocate for senior citizens, and we certainly have an aging population here in Connecticut. Uh, you won an award from ARP in 2012 uh, for your recognition of senior citizens' issues. Um, and many years in the political arena, would you ever think of running for governor? You know, it, uh, it's so flattering to think of that. There's no lack of folks that yeah, have well aspirations. You have well respected on both, both sides of the aisle. <laughs> Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I'd like to believe that. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been lucky enough to serve my constituents for the last 22 years, and now I'm going into 23 and 24. And thank you to everyone in the 7th District. 70% uh, voters supported me and 30% and supported my Democratic opponent. That That's a huge margin. Mm -hmm. So that's not... You have to think, consider things. I, I will say this. Uh, the longer I serve, the more people ask me that question. It takes a lot of effort uh, by one's family and supporters. You have to raise a tremendous amount of money, and it's never been my strongest ability to go out there and raise the kind of money you need to raise mm -hmm. to run for governor, and that's a reality. Uh, that's why I think so many folks within our party end up coming out of Fairfield County because there's so many resources mm. down there, whereas in our neck of the woods in north central Connecticut, a, a lot of people are struggling, even in what people perceive as affluent communities. But you're, you're leaving the door open. I, I I'm, I'm, you know, I would be a fool if I closed that door. Mm -hmm. it, let's say if someone came up to me and mm -hmm. said, would you be a running mate? I mean, I'd have to seriously consider that. I think that I bring a lot of strength to mm -hmm. a ticket. Uh, and it just depends on what the future holds. I sort of believe God has a magic way of making things unfold. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't have aspirations and dreams and work hard to attain those dreams. Uh, so, you know, part of life is being in the right place at the right time, but I'm also very much a realist in knowing that it takes an awful lot of hard work, both by yourself Certainly. and your family. And I still have a 10-year-old. Sure. And, you know, spending that much time away from my family to raise funds it's still maybe a few sure. years in the offing, but you know, if I keep coming out of elections with 70-30, yeah. uh, you know, I think well, people are going to stand up and take interview. notice. I want the first interview <laughs> when you say you're going to do it. Well, I want to give your website, sure. uh, Senator. It's ctsenaterepublicans.com slash home dash 
Kissel. And I want to also mention that your public access TV show is on Mondays at 9.30 p.m. on Cox and Field Channel 15. So it's uh, been a real pleasure. Susan, it flew by, my yeah, gosh. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll talk again. I'll we be shall. back. I'll be back. And you will get the scoop if I decide to do any kind thank of announcements. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Well, you can see us on Facebook, and you can see all of our programs on our website at www.ctvalleyviews.com. This is Susan Regan. Thank you for joining me and bringing proof to the people. Our thanks to Windsor Federal Savings for making this program possible. Neighbors helping neighbors since 1936.